Welcome to 1991 Movie Rewind, a podcast where we watch and review every movie released in 1991, from the all-time greatest classics to the critically panned and everything in between. We will rediscover forgotten fan favorites and uncover hidden gems as we explore the depths of direct video Join us in our celebration of the fun, unique, and diverse films of this highly underrated year. This week, we watched What About Bob? <laughs> on 1991 Movie Rewind. In What About Bob, renowned psychotherapist Dr. Leo Marvin, played by Richard Dreyfuss, is about to release his new novel, be interviewed by Good Morning America, and go on a month-long vacation with his family. The only thing standing in his way is his brand new patient Bob Wiley, played by Bill Murray, who is so dependent on therapy that he tracks the Marvin family down and refuses to leave. Screenplay by Tom Schulman, directed by Frank Oz, and released on May 17th, 1991. Have you seen What About Bob before? Yes, I have. You knew about Bob? Yeah, you haven't? No, I, I, I actually have. I oh. saw it... I did not see it when it came out. I probably saw it for the first time like in high school era. Oh. Like when I was working at the video store, it's like one of the things that I watched to try to get caught up with some of the classics that I missed. This is a classic then? Well, I mean, I don't know. It's a movie kidding. that a lot of people talk about. A lot of people know, have this kidding. in very high regard, right? I'm kidding. I didn't like it at that time. Like at all. I I mean, I, I liked certain scenes, which I still like the same scenes. Yeah. I, when we watched it again. I don't know, maybe I just wasn't, again, this is like high school era, right? So like maybe I just wasn't in the right mindset or I don't know. I, w I watched it alone, so maybe that was a factor too. You don't have like people to feed off of, which is sometimes helpful with comedy. Mm. Um, but watching it again this time, I enjoyed it a lot more, possibly because I wasn't expecting anything. Like I expected to kind of hate it. And so when I didn't hate it, mm. that just kind of... Um, elevated the whole thing but I know that a lot of people out there love it I don't understand <laughs> but to each their own I yeah, guess yeah I don't understand the love for it I don't know if it's because of Bill Murray I'm trying to think uh, of like Ghostbusters two. I know, like he, okay, he did like Scrooge and stuff like that. I'm trying yeah, to think yeah. of like Scrooge was probably like one of the more recent so he ones did, like, he had done. I'm um, thinking like Ghostbusters quick change two. right before this. <laughs> so, okay. so I'm thinking of like his Ghostbusters roles. Yeah. So like one and two. So two was in '89. So like probably after that even though he is but yeah he had been already right he, he was like a breakout but being star more in established as like like a movie star comedic yeah a movie person. star i guess yeah, he's I more know. of a movie star like this is where he, he becomes more popular mm -hmm. and well known maybe since his ghostbusters i don't know Did, I don't know he's always sort of had those roles though right because he had Caddyshack in the late 70s coming off of SNL or while he was in SNL I'm trying to he like had I guess Ghostbusters some... he had Stripes he had Meatballs okay okay so I'm like I'm trying to think because he has like somewhat minor role I know like Stripes no but he had like minor roles he was always just kind of like the funny guy that shows up even in like Tootsie you know he's just sure. like the friend yeah, that was much more of a side character um, That's what rather I, than a but then, leading role. You know, Ghostbusters, it's like, this is that was more of a leading role. Yeah, yeah, like Caddyshack was like a supporting thing. He was yeah. just like a goofball who appeared. Meatballs was more of a starring thing, but it wasn't that great of a movie uh, <laughs> yeah. um, either. Stripes, I don't like either. Yeah, Stripes was good up at, for, like, the first half of Stripes is fine, and then after that it was, eh. But yeah, I mean, after this, he had gone on, you know, he like he followed this up with stuff like Groundhog Day, which is like 
right one of my favorite movies of all time well, yeah this is pre like so this is like the like, start of that this is the beginning era, of him becoming guess, like a well-known star i guess I yeah like the bigger box i don't know bigger box office draw of, of him by himself rather than as part of a comedic team perhaps yeah um i, I think that, i mean honestly like the biggest joke or the one that everybody like would come back to is the i'm sailing right line. yeah like, that's I the mean, only that's... memorable line in the entire movie and that i can possibly think of i guess you could say like baby, baby, baby steps because steps, i used but... to say baby steps a lot when i was younger so there you go there's two lines but baby <laughs> steps isn't a funny line well I, the way he does it the way he's walking yeah. like baby steps in out of the door baby steps out of the apartment baby steps down the stairs like I thought when I was younger watching this, I thought that was funny. Yeah, I mean it's not it's not a bad scene. It's just um, just the way he did it. Yeah, made me laugh. But it's not and like a obviously like the I'm sailing. Mind. I still say that to like my friends to this day. I don't know. Yeah, his <laughs> his inflection on that is probably yeah. the best part. And and like yeah, the slow reveal. I forgot that it was like a slow reveal of him, a close up of his face. And then he's saying, I'm sailing a bunch of times. And then he keeps on panning yeah, out. Yeah. And you see that he's, like, tied, tied to the to mast. Tied to the mast, yeah. Uh, so that big reveal of it um, adds to the joke of it. But, man, yeah, it, it's so weird. Okay, so it's definitely, like, a Bill Murray vehicle for the most part, right? But he's sort of just playing the same character he did in Ghostbusters except with neuroses because he yeah. you know he's like super likable he's super charming to everyone he meets um you know he's quick-witted he's making like these little jokes and I mean, he's everything like playing himself yeah and maybe but I... as like this character that has like multiple like phobias right and I guess it was just kind of odd. I mean, that's what makes it appealing at all, is the fact that he can be a charming person, right? That, that's, like, the, the crux of the story is that he's, in essence, duping everyone around him mm -hmm. while showing his true self to Dr. Marvin, even though it's not, like, as underhanded and duplicitous as it sounds in that sentence. Um, so if you didn't have that charming personality, the movie would be annoying possibly but it also makes it weird because because he acts incredibly normal around other people and he can like it seems like he can touch people no problem you know like he's putting his arms around people in the picture shots and stuff like that when they're taking pictures and all these different types of things and you know like he's holding on to, to um, um siggy's vest and whatnot. Like, he has no problems with the germ stuff when he's interacting with other people. I think people. he... Because, um... The part where the daughter... Like, he's walking away. Yeah, he has and that And the line. daughter drives by. She's like, do you want to ride? And he, he pulls... He's got, like, this handkerchief or whatever. And he's about to use that to open the door. But he's like, has anyone... Has a lot of people used this? She's like, no, just the family. He's like, uh... All right. I right. think I think he's more of like a germaphobe, more for like public, like taking the bus or train or whatever, or going. I don't know. Yeah, or I'm sure like that's part of it. Millions of people around. I'm sure that's part of it, but I mean, yeah, just the fact that he doesn't really show the same sort of. Yeah, I, I like things. it's not consistent. Yeah, yeah, and he doesn't what, have like a germaphobe would probably be exactly, uh, and he doesn't exer. It, exude the same issues of like trying to get on the elevator that we see at the beginning or him leaving the apartment mm -hmm. you know because he's still going out into public right he's still going he's leaving the bus and he's just like standing there like yelling for the doctor but mm -hmm. you know he has no problem like leaving or going into the the diner you know he has no problem like leaving the house to go to other yeah, places yeah he's not like because so he's I not thought... doing some of the same stuff mm -hmm. all the time so you almost don't see enough of his his phobias. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was trying to find out. 
And then I did find like an article or something from like a actual neurosurgeon talking about his phobias. Like this one guy that I found, he wrote a book about you know movie like f- the like m- mental illness in movies. Okay. It was like a doctor that wrote books about or a book about that and how true to life it is, but he was saying like, you know, obviously this is just, you know, a comedy and everything. Mm-hmm. Even like the stuff between like Richard Dreyfus and him, like none of this would like ever happen in real life. Yeah. I mean, of course. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just trying to say like I know that he's emoting all these phobias, but he doesn't like act it out throughout the entire movie. Yeah, and, and I don't Except know... Except for, if... like, the beginning. Exactly. And I think that's part of my... I don't, I don't know if it's a problem but, with the movie, but, I mean, it's, it is it is odd. It is Yeah, off-putting. unless it's, like, his way of trying... Like, he's trying to help himself. Like, he, he talks himself into doing these things. He's like, okay, you're gonna do this. Right. And he, like... I don't know. And then that's with the whole thing with the baby steps. Like, he, he's, like, really obsessed. He becomes, like, really attached to the book that, you know, Richard Dreyfuss' character Yeah, he wrote. gets attached to the catchphrases. Yeah. Because right? I don't think like he, he actually read it, the book. Yeah, yeah. he just got, like, you know, Richard Dreyfuss is just, like, you know, giving him, like, a synopsis of what the book is. Uh-huh. And he's like, oh, okay. And he takes, like, a literal... He's taking things literal, like, oh, I have to take literal baby steps to do things. And then it really, like, triggered something in him, like, oh, this is helping me. Well, it's also, yeah, he just, like, latches on to other things. Like, before Dr. Marvin was his therapist, Mm. right, he was using this other guy, Carswell Fensterwald, which is a great name. Yeah. Um, and he was just chanting that he was, you know, h- h- that mantra of like, I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. Like nonstop. Well, that was, yeah. That was so like he that... was just replacing it with baby steps. So yeah. he, he needed something to chant and it just became that. Yeah. He just takes things very literal, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I understand that concept of like, you know, the family is sort of helping him overcome some of these issues potentially. Um, I don't think that they really explained that very well, if that's what was supposed to be happening. Um, it seemed more like Bob was trying to help the family get over some of their issues, like, you know, Siggy's diving thing and whatever, rather than them helping him, uh, even if it's inadvertent. Well, I mean, I think him helping them helped him as well. Possibly. Um, but either way, it definitely made Dr. Leo Marvin more... Yeah, angry. Angry and, and uh, mentally unstable. Um, and I think, to that regard, even though it's definitely known as a Bill Murray movie and a Bill Murray vehicle, Richard Dreyfuss's performance in this is incredibly good. Eh. <laughs> and powerful, because you can see that slow... Uh, that slow Anger, build up, yeah. yeah, you can like the t- the teapot is boiling, right? Like, it's, mm-hmm. You know, it's just he's getting redder and everything is boiling over until he just like I don't know. So I, I thought his his portrayal of someone who's in this situation where basically nobody else sees any problem with Bob existing or being around at all, and then he's trying to get Bob out of his life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and also try to convince his family this is not appropriate for a patient to come and find us on vacation and yeah. stay with us. And they're like, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's cool. Bob's fun. Yeah. He's, you know, he's <laughs> so like, yeah. The, nice guy. Why, like, why can't you see that he's a nice guy? Right. But, I mean, I mean, none of this would happen. Like, I don't no, know. Well, hopefully none of this would happen in real life. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, just like his performance of like slowly realizing, oh my God, I'm alone in this. I have to do something very drastic because this is not going well. And Bob is potentially a danger to my family. And yet he's becoming more of a danger to himself and to Bob and his family by letting his anger get to the level it does. I think it was just, I don't know. 
Dreyfus was like a underrated performance in this for me. Um, and it, it gets more and more. I'm trying to avoid using specific words. Like I don't, <laughs> like I don't want to say like crazy and insane. Yeah, we don't want to use like ableist, like able because yeah. I, I was gonna be like I don't know if we should do like a trigger warning because it's like making fun of like mental health because there's people out there that have these yeah, phobias and and I think it does yeah I think just blanket use this as your your warning, warning you know just because it does deal with those types of topics it also talks um jokingly about suicide to some degree at a part uh, yeah yeah there's a part um, where yeah he um, he pretends to kill himself and then Richard just Dreyfuss yeah just is, like just verbally says that it's been done yeah, yeah, you don't and see. Then, yeah, you don't see anything. Yeah, know. we don't see anything. It's just talked about. He uses then, that as part of his con to find out where he is. Yeah, and Doctor Marvin's just like, oh, he died. Oh, like he was just not very. Uh... <laughs> he wasn't he taken was not... aback, but he also would only have one conversation with the guy. It's not like yeah, he they built just up, like, a met big relationship. that day basically. And so yeah, it wasn't. And he, but he just didn't really feel so much remorse. He was like, oh, he died. Uh. Yeah. And then kind of just went back to sleep. Right. But, But yeah. anyway. Um, but the reason I was using those words at all was more to talk about the escalation of the situations in the movie, right? Like, it's not the people. In fact, I think that they, they show Bill Murray's psychoses. I wish they would have shown them a bit more or played off of them a little bit more, perhaps. I don't even know if that's really the right way to go about it. But I think... Um, or at least just been more consistent with it but I don't think that most of the comedy came from them like it wasn't really that funny to watch him struggle to get onto an elevator and then decide to take the stairs 40 floors up that wasn't that funny but I mean, it, yeah but it makes it but seem... the conversations and the reactions yeah um, were more funny Dr. Marvin you know running into car troubles and like having the mud splattered on him when it gets the flat tire near the end and mm -hmm. um you know like the the rainstorms and he like jumps and has like a physical fight with bob and he goes you know catatonic and stuff like that like you know it just kind of like it builds and builds into like this mountain of where the stakes have to get higher and higher basically all this time we have talked about dr marvin and bob wiley there are other members of the family. We mentioned Siggy a couple times, which is his son. Sigmund, also known as Siggy Marvin. He has a daughter, Anna, and a wife, Faye. Um, they don't have much of a role in this movie. I don't think. Like, I, I mean, they're almost there just to be like... Only there to tell... Dr. Marvin that he's wrong. Anna's mm. only there to bring him out on that boat for the one joke. Siggy's only there to have the diving thing be taken away from I mean, their, Dr. Marvin. I think their relationship it. was better. His Sigmund, Siggy with Bob. Because, you know, when Bob spends the night yes, they they kind of talk about their problems yeah they relate to each other um in a way they both relate because i mean siggy's going through his own stuff he, he he's like, going through a goth phase basically. he's like obsessed with death and when i was younger i like identified with siggy because even to this day i'm obsessed with death like uh, and then he's like he's like i'm just afraid of it yeah he's like Everything's like we're gonna all die. Gonna, yeah, we're, we're all, all gonna, gonna die. die. So what's and, the point of anything? Type yeah, of a situation. Yeah. Which, at that age, I was thinking the same thing, and then thirty years later, I still think the same thing. <laughs> yeah, there's always moments, right? Yeah, for sure. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, they they sort of talk. They have you they know, kind those of types go through their issue and they build because yeah, when they're about to go to sleep, he's like, "Are you?" Bob, are you afraid of death? And he's like, yeah. Like, they both just have, like, this 
come together conversation. Mm -hmm. But then they come over that fear by just, you know, making up like random swear words <laughs> like not even it's yeah, just like random because one of bob's fears like he said he doesn't only only fear death he also fears like developing tourettes yeah right <laughs> so um and that, that's something that's sort of a, like a recurring thing in the beginning where bob is having his initial meeting with dr marvin and says well if i fake it then i don't have it mm -hmm. so like if i fake having tourettes and just like spout out a bunch of random swear words and whatever then i know i don't have it and so he does the same type of thing with Siggy while they're both laying in bed, you know, opposite beds or whatever. Yeah. Uh, in, in the same room. And they just have like a, a swear fight. Type right. Of a thing like a, a rap battle <laughs> as it were, <laughs> who can come up with the most uh, crazy things. And those are probably some of the, the, the best, best part. Yeah. Moments. Like, I, I wish I wrote down some of the things they said. Did you? No, I uh -huh. didn't. It was very fast moving. Yeah, because like some of yeah. them were very you know standard swear words. It's like stuff and that when just, you, you were know, a kid that you would come up with, like yeah. you, you boob headed, like they would just yeah. like you boob headed fart. booger brain type of yeah, yeah. exactly. So like just like, combining all these like words that you know are funny and also could be bad words yeah. in one long word. Exactly. And so that's that's all that. It'll be like fart, booger, butt, diarrhea. Like they just sit, say mm -hmm. things, and they're like laughing. Yeah, that's probably the best part of the movie. Yeah. So. Um. But I mean, by and large, like I guess maybe it's more the the women characters, Faye and Anna. I don't think they have much of a role in this movie. Yeah, they're just kind of... They just they're... kind of exist to be contrarian to Dr. Marvin and be like, hey, you know, this guy's okay. And then, but, like, Siggy's yeah. where all the growth comes from. Yeah, they sort of show something with Anna where um, after she takes Bob sailing with her friends and then Dr. Marvin sees that and... He, after she's done she's like hey i told you to not to yeah, even speak to him. him don't yes. be near him don't speak to him and she's like why he's a fun guy and that's when he brings out these puppets like mm -hmm. it seems as if you know he's trying to use his psychotherapy on his children like oh, obviously yeah, by yeah. using but they have to talk through the puppets like it's puppet therapy yeah yeah, they they, have, they only show they that have for like puppets that look like themselves, and they like can't talk to each other yet. face to face. They exactly. have to th talk via the puppets because yeah. he's like using his puppet talking to his daughter, and she's trying to talk to him like a human, and she's like I he's like I don't hear you, I don't see you. And she has to put on her puppet to like mm -hmm. portray her feelings to him. But that was like the only part that he like yeah use right that there. with her. That's the only that's the only like real major interaction that they have with each other throughout the whole movie. And again, it's just don't see Bob, why not? Okay, I'm leaving, right? Yeah, it, and it was just like I told you to not talk to him or speak to him, whatever, or see him, blah blah blah. And she's using her puppet. She's like, "Oh, but why can't you just, you know, chill out because he's a good guy and he's fun to hang around with and that was just the extent of that conversation and that yeah. was it and, and that's what i found disappointing like we got more plot progression from mr and mrs gutman who ran the coffee shop yeah. than we did from like his own wife and daughter right you know like the gutmans wanted to buy the house that the marvins ended up buying and so they have like an incredibly deep-seated uh, like grudge against them like we saved our entire life to buy this house and put a down payment on it and then they swoop in and pick it up and we hate them for it mm -hmm. and so like we'll tell you exactly where he lives bob get in our car and like you see them like in the lake like in the boat like eavesdropping on them at various <laughs> different points and like rooting against dr marvin it's 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 a nice little funny callback that happens a couple different times and um but yeah like that's more of a plot than what we get from a couple of these people 
Which is disappointing because, like, again, we have good actors. We have good actresses in, in these roles. Um, and they just aren't given anything to do. I'm assuming we're both in agreement that Bob clearly went too far and that Dr. Marvin is actually in the right. <laughs> right. Least, you know, at least for the most part until he, like, goes to the point of um, until trying to physically harm him. Right. To the point where Dr. Dr. Marvin takes him to like a mental hospital even that i don't know like it's weird that that happened but like you know if that's a potential way out and a safe way to keep him away from the family then maybe that's okay i don't know but um i mean if for him wouldn't he like why wouldn't you just if we're just doing this realistically why wouldn't you just like call the cops or something uh yeah that, it, honestly that'd be the better way to go right and, like this person is not leaving me alone i've told him to go and he's not but, yeah you know obviously you'd have your family mad at you but but i mean he's he's breaking this you know client patient or yeah. like patient doctor relationship like he's just going yeah, too the, far the, the thing that we see a lot in movies is you know people not telling each other what the actual situation is you know like he tries at some point and be like look this is breaking the patient doctor rules right. but he doesn't say this is inappropriate for a patient to follow me i did not tell him where i lived i did not tell him where i was vacationing at all he found us by who knows what manipulation yeah i don't know him i've only had one conversation with him we don't know how dangerous he is right like he, none of that was actually said i mean he portrayed that to his family when you know bob first appears somewhat yes but yeah it, it's just i don't know it, it's weird but, you know, the, he just the, wins the family over, and they're like, oh, just, you know, go with it. He's nice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, it, it's just weird to me, like, when it seems like a simple conversation would solve a lot of plot problems, um, but there also be, then it would mean that there the would be movie no wouldn't movie. exist. Yeah, there would yeah. be no movie if he, he called the like cops a, on him. <laughs> but it does create, like, a plot hole in my mind that is yeah. tough for me to get over, is what I mean. Like, we, you know, we are the same thing in like Cape Fear, right? Like when, you know, Juliette Lewis's character was trying to go see Robert De Niro yeah. and like, you know, the father was not telling her, Hey, stay away from this guy. He's a very specific type of criminal. Do not do this. He's just like, I don't want you near that man. And he doesn't yeah, say he why. doesn't say why. Like just give Just yeah, give like, the reason why. And it Yeah, makes, she's you know, a we're going back to episode yeah, one. Know. <laughs> like she's like a seventeen-year-old girl. She understands things. Yeah. I yeah. think we even talked about like like just we talk did. to her like in a like as you would any other human. Exactly. Like the way that parents talk to children sometimes, it makes it feel like the children are like always dumb. Mm-hmm. Even even though they are seventeen. And we see that here. Like that's part of what Anna has to deal with with the puppets. Right, it makes yeah, and she's it's like, like, oh, I'm. You're I don't me like. like a I'm assuming baby. she's like seventeen. I mean, that's probably around there. Yeah. I'm like, I didn't really know. I she knows how to drive, so I was like, okay, she's over sixteen, but uh -huh. I think she's like eight, like high schoolish, uh, and I'm thinking like Siggy's like eleven or whatever. Yeah, I think they say yeah, it's probably around that age. Um, I did notice he was playing Game Boy. At we got our point. third movie. We got at least our third movie with the Game Boy sightings, so we're going to put together that list at some point here. Game Boy sightings. <laughs> huh? Yeah, Game yeah Boy we're going to have to do Game Boy sightings. I've not been able to determine what game any of one has played, but there was a cartridge in there. I don't know what. Anyway. Can we talk a little bit about the scene about like him like trying to find out where, where Dr. they were vacationing? Yeah, Dr. Marvin. Yeah. Because, I mean, those were kind of, like, they were good bits. I don't know. Like, there was, like, kind of funny scenes. They are, but... Like, obviously none of it should have happened. But, no. Like, you know, but it's still, Just like, the kind way of funny he... how it happened. Barged. Okay, so, he, like, he, he like, calls... He by manipulating. Yeah. He, so he calls his 
the Dr. Marvin's office? Like, are the, is that like the switchboard? Like those three ladies? Yeah, it's like ladies. an answering service. Okay, yeah, but so he not knew his where office, they. But it's an answering service. But he that, like, knew where that office was because he eventually goes into that room where those three ladies are. Yeah, that and I don't know. That's why I was like, knows. how did he know where they were? Unless they were in the same building as where Dr. Marvin worked. Theoretically, it shouldn't be, but yeah, you're right. That's another sort of plot hole, possibly. That, I was trying to figure out. I was like, are they just like three overnight receptionists, like hanging out in that office, just answering phone calls? Mm hmm. Pretty much. That's, yeah. The, but yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, yeah, there's like a split screen type of a thing, and he's like, I need to talk to Dr. Marvin. It's an emergency. And she's like, Well, no. Uh, like this other doctor is handling his calls. Like, it's I on can. Vacation, whatever. And... and he's like, Well, it's an emergency, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, Well, you can call, if it's an emergency, you can call the ER, or you can call this other doctor that's in replace of Dr. Marvin for the month. Yep. And he's like, No, I need to speak to Dr. Marvin, but she won't. And that's when... Yeah, he, 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 throws, some double, fun. he throws some double talk and is, yeah. like, crying and stuff. And, yeah, he eventually, like, is yeah, able but to... But like, to the connected. point where he... It made it sound as if he was going to kill himself. Yes. Because that's when she finally just gives in. And she's it, like, I'll patch you in. She's like, I'm not going to give you his number. Right, right. Yeah, I'll call him, whatever, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, he also made it sound like, no, Dr. Marvin's expecting my call. He said to call, like, he said whatever. Yeah. Oh, whatever. He, he made it sound like she was going to get in trouble or whatever. Um, and then the second time, he hires someone else. He hires what is credited as a prostitute in the credits, but all she does is dial a phone, a pay phone, and, you know, pretend to be somebody, and then hands the phone over to Well, pretends to be to Dr. Bob. Marvin's sister, and I was oh, like... Oh, that's right, yeah. I was like, why would, if their brother's sister, why would the sister call his office secretary or what receptionist line? Right. Why wouldn't they already have each other's phone numbers, <laughs> yeah. like personal numbers? I mean, numbers. it is a vacation house, so maybe who knows. But. Yeah. I don't, that, well, his relationship with his sister, we can talk about later, maybe, because yeah, yeah, I yeah. thought that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, that prostitute was played by Ida Turturro. Um, had, like, one line in this movie, basically. Yeah. Uh, but she is a two-time Emmy nominee for Sopranos as uh, Tony's yeah. sister. Yeah. Um, She's also the co cousin of John Turturro. Yes. She's been in a bunch of stuff, but most notably Sopranos. Yeah, as the sister. Um, and so, yeah, that's the second patch through. And then the third one is where... Bob goes to the answering services office in a trench coat holds out his blue cross blue shield card and says it's an <laughs> right. fbi badge and claims he's law enforcement and that he's Saying investigating that, yeah. a homicide yeah. of bob who had claimed who had committed suicide right uh, and, and they're they're the three ladies are like flummoxed with this and yeah th it's like if you they could have been like, hey, can I see additional ID or can yeah, I... Yeah, they don't actually look at it, but the camera gets to see the Blue Cross Blue Shield. Right, <laughs> that. But, and then they believe him. Right, yeah. Because he he poses as an FBI agent. <laughs> Which is, I don't know. It is very weird. It's, yeah, like, it's, unrealistic, but uh, whatever. It is kind of funny how he's able to, like, manipulate and get his way in this whole thing, but, yeah. So yeah, he, the he lady, learns, yeah, yeah, he, the, he just pretends go. that he's a detective. He's like, okay, we're, we're going to try, you know, unfortunately Bob died or was killed, even though he said by suicide, <laughs> the homicide said, of a yeah, suicide. He's investigating a homicide for oh. Bob who had committed suicide. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Yep. Which, I mean, that's funny, I mm -hmm. guess. But, um... Yeah, and then they're like, "I'm gonna need his doc, like his doctor's information, and blah blah blah." Yeah, if I need it, I need it. If I need to contact his therapist, where would I find him right now? And you know, and they really didn't know. They were just like they mentioned that they were going to New Hampshire. They looked up like yeah the address of like the town basically. It was like I forgot what I didn't write down the name of the, the lake. It, like, lake Winnipesaukee. Winna that sounds right. In New in New Hampshire, and he's like, "Oh, oh, New Hampshire," and then. So he just books, 
Well, he gets a bus ticket to New Hampshire to Lake Winnipesaukee mm-hmm. that night. And I guess he gets there the next morning. Gets, yeah, annoys the hell out of the passengers as well as the bus driver played by Lori Tan Chin, who was in Orange is the New Black. Yes. Mei Chang, also in Aquafina's series Nora from Queens. Yeah. And four episodes of Roseanne as well as She Devil, so she had a <laughs> relationship with Roseanne back in those days to some degree. Um, it's just kind of weird, like seeing like recognizable actors like all over the place in bit parts in this movie. So right, but yeah, like he gets off the bus and the rest of the people who are there like clapping and cheering as they drive away. Yeah, once he gets off the bus, yeah, yeah. and then he just starts yelling in the middle of the town, like Doctor Marvin. <laughs> Dr. Which, Marvin. I mean, I think that's kind of it, funny. Yeah, it is a really funny bit, because he doesn't want to move, necessarily. And he's, he just he's, stands, yeah, in the middle of the town, yeah. screaming his name, as if Dr. Marvin just is within the vicinity, but he, he actually happens is, be, yes. he happens to be in, within the vicinity. <laughs> just coincidentally, he is, yeah. And that starts the whole thing. Um so yeah, they, they, we sort of like regressed in the plot. <laughs> that's that's sort yeah. of what got him to the the town. He won't leave uh, at all. Um, but he also brings his fish. We haven't talked about his fish at all. Yeah. Uh, Gill, the goldfish, he carries around in a jar in his neck. Yeah, and, and I... then it becomes like nothing after a while. Well, cause I was scared for the fish because I was like, did he poke holes in that jar lid? Mm-hmm. And I don't know if... I mean... Because he kind of implies... He says it's been eight hours. I need a bowl right now when he gets into the coffee shop. Yeah, that's why I was like, I don't think that fish would have made eight hours without any sort of, like, air He holes. could have unscrewed the lid at some point during yeah, the trip. Yeah, <laughs> That's I, I was or, worried yeah, about like, the maybe, fish. maybe, like, re- replace the water in a bathroom or something along the way. I don't know. But. Yeah, but yeah, he the was like, survives. I need a bowl, I need a bowl immediately for Gil. Yeah. And then he brings, I mean, he's at that coffee shop because he, Dr. Leo, he, after screaming Dr. Leo and Dr. Leo seeing him from grocery shopping, he's kind of like, oh, that's Bob. And we need to get out of here quickly. So he's, like, trying to, you know, walk away, get in his car quickly. But, you know, Bob sees him. And it's like, I need to talk to you. And that's when Dr. Marvin is like, okay, well, you're not coming to my house. I'll mm-hmm. call you at this coffee shop. Yeah, like, this is wholly inappropriate. Right. I'm not here to have any sort of patient set- sessions at all. Go book your ticket for the return trip home. I'll call you from the at the coffee shop. Yeah. And then we can talk gone. there, but then you got to go home. Yeah. And that's when the gutmans tell him where he lives and brings him to the house. Right. Because, because they, they have this personal vendetta, I guess. Yeah. And so. But I mean, he takes his fish with him because when he mm-hmm. gets to Dr. Marvin's house, he's like, I need a bowl for Gil again. And, but the, after that, that's when we never see Gil. Pretty much never. Yeah. I wanted to see more Gil. Like, I mean,. You know, around his neck yeah or like, i don't know even like at the end with the big resolution like what if he had him like there at the wedding you know uh, what I mean? like around his neck yeah something oh, like that funny yeah, you know you know, like <laughs> dressed up and <laughs> put a little like bow tie on the jar or like siggy's holding him or something sure so um yeah we're kind of like skipping around a little bit to the beginning if we talk mm-hmm. about the middle for the most of this thing so why don't we go ahead and skip to the end where you know there's like the big um to the point where dr marvin is like i've had it and you know first he takes him to a mental hospital but then that hospital is like you got to take him back because yeah, he's, he's not yeah he's he's fine i don't know he's why not, you brought him yeah here he's not mentally thing. unstable i don't know why you brought him here yeah and then you see him you know telling jokes to all the staff and patients there mm-hmm. and then he's got to go home <laughs> or but then dr marvin I don't know, things escalate to the point where dr marvin um tries to leave him on the side to, of the road tries to leave him on the side of the road you know, <laughs> you know? Obvi- he gets bob gets picked up by a hitchhiker 
Dr. Marvin sees that. His car goes in like a ditch. Yeah, after he got pulled over for speeding. Yeah, he gets pulled over. His car then, like, the tire runs out of air. So all this shit's happening. Yeah, yeah, all this shit's happening to Dr. Marvin. He's getting, like, angrier and angrier. And then all of this, when he finally comes home, they, they do, like, a surprise birthday party for him which apparently was something (laughs) like they didn't even talk about his birthday the entire time well the other thing that we didn't talk about was you know the interview Mm -hmm. which that was the the day before or the day of yeah i think it was that very morning it was like a live good morning america interview yeah but then yeah and then after that that's when he's like i'm taking you to the yeah mental hospital because this is like going to be his big shining moment to promote his book and then like good morning america the crew came and they're like let's get bob in there like let's get let's have him right because that was the uh, of you. the night before was the night where bob had to sleep over sleep over because you know there was a huge rainstorm yep and you couldn't get back and he couldn't get back to wherever he was staying which it looked as if he was just staying next door to them I don't know where he was actually staying, but like... Well, because it the seemed like the Gutmans left. set him up at a house. Because he was like, oh, the Gutmans set me up with a place. And it looked as if it was like right next to them. I don't know. Anytime like he was walking home, like when Anna picked him up, he was like walking along that long stretch of road. road. So... For the first time... It wasn't close enough to walk without getting like wet or struck by lightning or something. You know what I mean? So yeah, like, I know. it wasn't safe. But... Okay, the first time that Dr. Marvin supposedly sends him home, the next morning, Bob is, like, ringing a bell, you know? Is that, like, was that at his, at Dr. Marvin's house? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Because yeah. it looks he never a... really leaves. Right. The whole joke. I thought he was next door. No. So he just came back that next morning and started ringing that bell. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He basically Because then he, there he the said the Gutman time. found a place for me to stay. Stays. Yeah, we don't see where he stays, but he's like, oh yeah, the Gutman's hooked me up. Yeah. Because you know, even before that, Dr. Marvin's like, why don't you take a vacation? Mm-hmm. And Bob's like, okay, but he takes a vacation in the same spot that Dr. Marvin is. Yeah, he's like, I'm going to take a vacation with you. Right. Yeah. He's like, I took your advice, and I'm on a vacation. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, all that stuff happens. Uh, we get another sort of, like, cameo appearance when the Good Morning America interview happens with Reggie Cathy. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce his last name. Cathy? Cathy? Uh, who's known mostly for House of Cards. He won an Emmy for that and got two other no- Emmy nominations for House of Cards um he's also been on like the oz the wire luke cage and then uh Uh, oz uh yeah he's in a few episodes of oz yeah um and then also square one television which is one of my favorite shows to bring up Mm -hmm. he was on that so uh another person who made it you know made it sort of big afterwards um but yeah surprise birthday party after the interview um bob's there getting cozy with leo's sister yeah the surprise is that leo's sister's there and for real this time yeah not ada (laughs) Turturro, the real sister and Uh, it seems that well they said that she came in from chicago or whatever but it seems as if these people like he and his sister haven't seen each other in like ages or something because he he was like oh my god yeah there's a huge crowd of people there which is weird because like leo would have had to walk home because his car was flat tire on the side of the road not working he was walking with like mud and everything Mm. Uh, and so he would have to like walk whatever trail from wherever he was back home and here's like the sea of people in the backyard and like you don't see any cars anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean know, it seems you'd like think they I don't know known something was up unless I mean, they he purposely like tunnel vision ignored it. But. Yeah, I don't know how big this town is if just people walked and over to their house and hung out in their backyard. Yeah, it's tough to them, say. Like instead of driving. But he sees Bob with Lily, 
uh, immediately lunge, like jumps and lunges towards him and, and whatever. Um, and then, he, yeah, he, uh, later that night, he tries to blow Bob up. <laughs> yeah, he goes he, to a store. Yeah, some he explosives tells. He and, goes to the store. He gets like, gasoline, whatever, <laughs> like, yeah, like explosives. Like yeah, it's explosives and uh, and a shotgun. Um, and then yeah, he tells takes Bob into the middle of the woods, ties him up. He's like, "This is death therapy." Mm-hmm. And so like he packs up the bombs and everything, and then like rolls them out to the lake. Goes away. Yeah, and walks away. And then Bob takes this as like. A legitimate test. Yeah. Yeah. It's he's like, like oh, oh death I get there. it. I know what I'm supposed to do. I need to untie my knots. You know. And like, he's I saying like all the all these phobias are my problems, so I have to untie my problems by untying these knots. Yeah. And so he does. <laughs> he's able to get out of it. He gets back to the house, um, which thankfully is like unoccupied. He puts the bombs down inside the house. Evidently, he walks out with the birthday cake. Right. To Leo, the family pulls up. Uh, I don't know where they were. They were out looking for. They were looking for them both. For Bob. T- no, not for Bob. They were oh, looking for Leo. For, for yeah, Leo, because they thought Leo was sedated and wasn't going to be able to leave, but he had left. Yeah. So they were looking for Leo, um, and then the house blows up. And, and the, the Gutmans are, are on the super end. Happy and they're, they're like, yay! <laughs> I mean, the gut. The whole thing with the Gutmans is funny too. Yeah. Yeah. Just the way they hate Dr. Marvin. And mm-hmm. they're, I mean, it's because the old woman is like, you son of a bitch. Like, that's right. every time she sees him. And then Mr. Gutman's like, she's never she, like this. Yeah, she's she never, never like says that. this. Yeah. And it's that's like every scene with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good I mean, that's joke. a good little, yeah, bit. Uh, and then the, the very end, uh, yeah, Dr. Leo's like virtually catatonic. Um, and then... Bob marries Lily. Right, yeah, Bob... Or and that snaps him Leo. out of it because he's like trying to object to the marriage. Yeah. It, and they're like, oh, <laughs> you're awake again, yay! And that's like the end of the that's movie. The of the is movie. like, Leo finally said a word. <laughs> and they're like, oh, he speaks all of a sudden. Because yeah. he hasn't spoken since, I don't know how many, like, yeah, who years knows how long. or months or days have been, have gone. Who knows how long it had been. But I just think it's weird, like, how, just, uh, I mean, the sis, Lily is, like, barely in it. Yes. Very, And it's very... like, they don't really show him, you know, Bob, like, you know, romantically with Lily, like, at all, I guess. No, yeah, just like, you know, when they're at the party, they kind of have their arm he has like his arm around her shoulder or something because i'm sure you know because he had been super friendly and like personable yeah, he, with everybody yeah. so it didn't seem like anything romantic at and the she's time. just like oh yeah he's a nice guy but yeah. everyone thinks he's the nicest guy yeah so i mean it only makes sense in terms of anything to make leo miserable so of course him marrying the sister would make him the most miserable so yeah, that's why yeah. it happened type of thing so and then you know at the end credits it's or, I don't know if it's like the end credit. Not really the it's, end credits. It, like no, near the end where Bob... Text went, epilogue. Yeah, okay. Like, yeah, at the very end before the credits, it said that Bob went back to school, became a psychologist, and then he wrote a book called Death Therapy. Yeah. And that Leo is suing him for the rights. Yes. The end. That's it. <laughs> no bloopers. Nope. Learn there from, there learn would have from, been some good bloops. There was probably there like a lot. Yeah, like some good like improv outtakes. Oh yeah, like especially like in the Tourette's scenes and stuff. Oh like yeah, that. like, or, like in that initial that meeting where he's like faking the heart attack and stuff like that. You know, there could have been some good stuff in there. Like learn from fight to fight back to school. Like let's put some let's get some bloopers in here. Yeah. So overall, I mean, like it it progressed well enough. Like it, you know, had a good flow to it. Um, I liked the slow transition of Dreyfus's character. Um, Bill Murray is certainly personable, but yeah, overall, there's just you know, it's not the it's not the funniest thing in the world. I don't uh, I don't understand the cult appeal of it. Yeah, I don't but know. It's okay. This isn't to me a cult movie, but I don't. Know. I don't know. It's just like when I talked, 
I don't know, when I've talked to people about... About what about Bob? People are like, oh, why? Yeah. It, yeah, it's just, it, it's one of the ones that people bring up for him, and I don't understand it. So, I don't know, maybe you guys can tell us in the comments and the emails I mean, I don't whatever, hate, yeah. Like, I what, mean, I what think when I was growing, when I was growing up as a kid, I really liked this for some weird reason, because you hated it, and I, but... I don't know. That's I not just why thought, you liked it. <laughs> I liked it because it was silly to me. And yeah. I think people who maybe are I maybe... Maybe wanted something sillier. I, cause I think people who are our age who are like, oh, yeah, maybe they, they were like, oh, I remember... It's like nostalgia where it's just like, I remember liking it when yeah. I was younger. Like, maybe I wanted something more, like, crazy. You're not, I, I don't, shouldn't have used that word. Like, something, like, more outrageous in terms of like Bill Murray's performance right like maybe I wanted him to go farther with it as a younger person mm. um, now I can see and appreciate some more like the subtlety of the characters that that's in here um, and like appreciate like you know the dinner scene where he's like just moaning non-stop while he's eating right. the corn just like, that annoying wasn't just, that wouldn't have been funny to Dr. me back then but yeah Dr. Like, Marvin even more yeah and then you know the family's just like oh he really likes this food right and they're just like amused by him yeah. doing that yeah because he's a goofball yeah um but yeah that's about it I guess we we covered pretty much everything else right yeah yeah so we'll talk a little bit about the cast and crew that we haven't covered so far. Uh, we'll start with Frank Oz, the director. Uh, he does have an Emmy win and four nominations for The Muppet Show. I think pretty much everyone who knows who Frank Oz is knows him for his voice acting work because he does work with The Muppets and has since basically the very start. Um, he's the voice of Miss Piggy, Fozzie, Cookie Monster, Grover, Bert, Animal, Sam the Eagle. He's also the voice of Yoda in the Star Wars movies. As a director, he's also done Dark Crystal, Muppets Take Manhattan, Little Shop of Horrors, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, and also in 1991 he did Muppet Vision 3D for Walt Disney World theme parks hmm. in addition to this. So no way to watch those types of things anymore, unfortunately, but uh, that was his other 1991 credit. Writer Tom Schulman is an Oscar winner for Dead Poet Society. Um, he's also done Honey, Sh I Shrunk the Kids movie Second Sight and Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag, so he kind of uh, lost the prestige as he went along <laughs> the yeah. road there a bit. Um, Bill Murray we talked about a lot. He has an Oscar nomination for Lost in Translation. Surprisingly, that's really his only Oscar nomination. He won a Golden Globe for that role. He has two Emmy wins. One is for SNL uh, and the other is for Olive Kitteridge, which I forgot was a thing that existed. Um, he won the Spirit, Independent Spirit Award for Rushmore and also Lost in Translation. Um, we already talked about a whole bunch of his other credits in there as well. Um, but I will mention uh, he is nominated, the only award for this movie, uh, nomination, this is worth mentioning, is the MTV Movie Awards. He was nominated for the Best Comedic Performance uh, for this, but he lost to, can you guess? Comedy. Best comedy performance at the MTV Movie Awards. Is it a movie we've seen? Not yet for the podcast, no. Oh. Uh, Billy Crystal for City Slickers won. Oh, okay. Won the day. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but he had later been nominated for the MTV Movie Awards for Groundhog Day, Lost in Translation, and Zombieland. So, uh, Richard Drive is where I talked about him. He's an Oscar winner for Goodbye Girl. At the time, he was the youngest... Academy Award acting winner of all time. Uh, he's been nominated for Mr. Holland's Opus. Uh, he's been nominated for the Golden Globes for American Graffiti. Um, he's obviously been in Jaws, Close Encounters, and Krippendorf's Tribe. Uh, we'll see him in a couple other 1991 movies, Once Around and Prisoner of Honor. Julie Haggerty played his wife, which we barely talked about like at all. We didn't even mention her by name during this whole thing. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I mentioned her last week because she was in that one show, and I forgot the name of that show. Princesses. Princesses. Yeah, that she was, was the only part... thing that she was doing around this time. Yes. Her first role, as far as I can tell, ever was Airplane, so it was a very good first role for her. She was in like Lost in America and Beyond Therapy, and also more recently Marriage Story. Um, and she has a Razzie nomination for Freddie Got Fingered. 
Mm. So <laughs> runs the gamut. But I really liked her performance in this. I think honestly, like her timid voice, like made her lines funnier. Yeah, just her demeanor. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. Definitely. Uh, Catherine Irby, Herb, Irby, E R B E. I really don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, she played Anna, the daughter. Um, she was in the TV show around this time called Chicken Soup. Actually, I think it was a couple years before, uh, which was a TV show that starred Jackie Mason and Lynn Redgrave. I'm not sure if you remember that at all, but that was a thing that existed. Um, she was also in Mighty Ducks 2, Stir of Echoes. She had a role in Oz. Yes. Uh, she was in Law and Order Criminal Intent for 144 episodes. And she's also married, or was married, uh, in 1993 to Terry Kinney. Mm -hmm. Who's also who, in Oz. Who was also in Oz. Uh, we talked about him when we covered Talent for the Game, co-founder of Steppenwolf Theater. Fran Brill played Sister Lily. Uh, she's also a Sesame Street person. She rarely does, like, on-camera work. Um, she's the voice of Zoe. Or Zoe? Zoe. It must be Zoe. Yeah. Uh... She's a later character. She wasn't around when I watched Sesame Street. But she was also the voice of Prairie Dawn on that. Uh, she also did some voices on the TV show Doug um, alongside Doris Black, the one who played Dr. Tomsky at the uh, the Insane Asylum thing they took him to. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Doris was Tippy Dink on Doug, mm. which is interesting. So we had two Doug voices in this cast, which is cool. Um, and then I think lastly, I want to mention, uh, Marcella Lowry, who played Betty, the switchboard operator that he got, you know, yeah. manipulated a bunch. She's going to be in the 1991 movie, New Jack City. So we'll see her again pretty soon, but she has a very recognizable face. I'm like, where did I, where do I know her from? Could be in many different things. She's in a couple episodes of the Cosby show. Um, she was in 74 episodes of Ghost Rider. If you ever watched that on PBS, W R I T E R, yeah. you know, the, the kids show um she was on 105 episodes of a show called city guys which was kind of like kind of like saved by the bell i guess i've never heard of it mm -hmm. but like it's you know the quote-unquote urban version um so i don't know uh and then she also played donovan McNabb's mom in those campbell soup commercials from like 10 years ago so you've seen her a whole bunch probably but that's that's who that is um, and then there are other people we've we've talked about. So, good, pretty good stacked cast. Uh, the last person. Oh, I'm sorry. The, I did want to pause on the credits yeah, really quickly we, to talk I was about. Like, you talk about Siggy, the most important. <laughs> I don't know if it's the most important, but um, and possibly the most interesting. So I like to pause on the credits uh, when we have someone who goes beyond acting. Um, and so Charlie Cars, uh, Charlie Corsmo. He was nominated in, in this year uh, for the Best Young Artist Award, uh, but that was for his work in Hook. Um, he had also previously been in Dick Tracy. Um, I know him from Can't Hardly Wait, yes, which is a movie I've watched dozens of times. Um, he's the nerd that no yes. one really likes. Yeah, he's the nerd who's there to you know infiltrate the party and like get drunk and try to uh, scam. Um, the jock character and get incriminating photos with him. Um, he's also going to be in the 1991 movie, The Doctor, so we'll see him again in that, and also in Hook, so we'll see him two more times. Uh, he also had to turn down Terminator 2. He was going to be Edward Furlong's role as John Connor, uh, but he turned it down in order to do this movie. Hmm. He was already pre-committed to What About Bob? So that's pretty interesting in and of itself. Uh, nothing from him after 1991 until can't hardly wait and then nothing from him after that until a movie called chain for love 20 years later and the reason for that is that he decided in 1991 to quit acting he's like i don't want to do this anymore i don't i want to focus on school work and i want to focus on having a normal life this is not as fun for me as i thought it would be so i'm just not going to do it which, I don't know, I think he's a good actor. He, yeah, he's definitely a good actor. But, he, but, I mean, whatever. I mean, that's fine. And that's I mean, why child he acting. Kind of, I mean, I, I feel yeah. like child actors get, like, really messed up. And he I probably mean, recognized that yeah. to a degree. He probably saw that with some of the people he was, you know, in Hook with or, you know, 
just hanging around the industry and you know he wasn't from LA so he had to like fly in to do all these movies and then go back home right you know so like that's that was part of it too it's like well I'm not in LA I have to like go away from my family my friends do these movies I don't know if I want to do that and I don't want to move here all that kind of stuff sort of factored in the decision so the reason he did can't hardly wait was to determine if he was making a mistake with his life Mm. it was like well, I did this, I was successful, I was good at it, should I come back? And so he did this one movie, which wasn't a huge success financially, but um, again, he did really well in yeah. the role. Um, and that was his proof to himself, like, yeah, no, I'm not missing anything by not acting. So he just didn't do it. Um, and instead, he went to school, got his bachelor's degree in physics, and then he went to law school at Yale. <laughs> I sort of mixed up my words there. <laughs> he went to Yale for law school. Um, and as far as we can tell right now, he is an assistant professor of law. Uh, he is a teacher uh, of law. He's worked for the EPA. Um, he was part of the Federalist Society in college. Uh, he's worked for, for the Republican Party. In 2011, he was appointed by Obama as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Barry Goldwater Scholarship and Excellence in Education Foundation. So he's well regarded in, in the legal field, at least in, in, you know, to get these types of positions and recognition uh, and uh, be trusted to be teaching fellow law students or future law students, whatever you want to call it. So that's how Charles Car- Corsmo's life turned out so far. On to true crime and pop culture we go, I guess. Yep. So, I haven't done this in a while. Not since maybe... Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Or even with Freddy's Dead. Where I just give certain facts about behind the movie. Like filming locations and other info. Yeah. And then I found out something else that they were going to make a tv show oh about this yeah oh interesting so that's what i'm gonna talk about (laughs) well because we we're we're already like almost an hour in so yeah and also we've had a lot of movies in may of 1991 yeah we've had a lot of movies that have a lot of song info so a lot of the music and tv have been talked about like we had europa which is may 12th pit in the pendulum which is may 31st and then Rock and Roll High School, that was May 23rd. So, yeah. It was just been like repetitive stuff. Next year we'll probably, or next next week we'll probably have some good stuff because it'll be a whole new month we haven't covered at all. Yes. So, one of the things, I found a couple articles. One of them was this year because it was like a 30th year recognition thing from this what, or website called Rare Entertainment. And um, it talked about how Bill Murray and Richard Dreyfus did not get along on set. And maybe hmm. that amplified, like, the anger so much with Richard Dreyfus. Hmm. Maybe. So they're, the on-set feud. Directed... Especially if Bill Murray <laughs> knew how to, like, press his buttons. That's exactly, yeah. I think. I mean, he was doing... So Bill Murray was doing his job. Mm-hmm. Like, on and off set, I guess. I guess so. But then it escalated to the point where um, director Frank Oz admitted that while filming What About Bob, he said it was very difficult, and he said that Murray and Dreyfus did not get along at all. Bill Murray and Richard Dreyfus have been interviewed separately at other times, like 10, 15 years ago, just talking about this movie and... They both just don't say nice things about each other. Mm. And in this article, Richard Dreyfus went out, he just went out and said, like, I'm just going to tell you right now that I didn't talk about this for years, but Bill just got really drunk one time at a dinner. And this is a quote. He was an Irish drunken bully is what he is. He came back from dinner and walked in and I said, read this script tweak. I think it's really funny. And 
Bill put his face next to me, nose to nose. He screamed at the top of his lungs saying, lungs saying, everyone hates you, you are tolerated. There was no time to react and Bill leaned back and took a, an ashtray and threw it at his face, but think, I guess it missed him, but you know, Richard Dreyfus said that he tried to hit me. Mm. So they just didn't get along. And I, I mean, I've read and heard about things how Bill Murray is just... He's different things He's like a people. difficult person. Right. And I don't know if he's like... I mean, he seems... Because, you know, he comes to Chicago a lot and people see him and it seems like with fan interactions, he's fine. I guess when he's like getting drunk, I guess he's just like a mean drunk. Yeah. That's what it seems like. Yeah, there's, you know, the cult of Bill, right? Yeah. That, you know, that whole thing that sort of exists. But yeah, I've definitely heard that about him as well that he can be very difficult on set and you can understand um where that impression comes from yeah then there's like this other article it was just like 20 random facts about the movie and it was just saying how they were going to cast um woody allen as dr leo marvin at one point but woody okay. allen turned it down because you know woody allen only works on his own things virtually yeah that was the reason yeah which i mean i'm kind of glad huh. yeah and then there was also at one point that um robin williams was gonna play the bill murray character bob he was okay. gonna be bob but you know robin williams was in the fisher king so yeah which a better that's a better, better role. Fit, better fit for him. And then it was also rumored that Patrick Stewart may have played Dr. Leo Marvin as well, hmm. which that would have been interesting cuz I mean that's like he would be like on next generation at that point, right? Yeah, probably for a couple of years, right? Yeah. Maybe that's right, 87ish. Yeah, so I mean he's like well into TNG. So it would have been interesting. It's, yeah, of... it, it, it might have been tougher for people to separate him from like it, Picard. The, yeah. But, I mean, he's like a comedy. I mean, he's well known to be like a funny guy, I guess. Yeah, yeah, so I mean... it would have been funny to see him in that. And uh, so the, another, a couple other articles that I found about this was that they were going to make this was in 2017 and it was from variety and it it was like two separate articles one came out in march in 2017 and then a second one came out in may 2017 the march article said that nbc is casting for a pilot about what about barb so they were going to do mm. a female centric TV show. Okay. And it was casting Leah Remini as the Dr. Leo part. Okay. And then this um British actress, I've never I was trying to look her up and I couldn't really find her in like anything else. Her name is Jess, Jessica Gunning. She was going to play Barb. Okay. And NBC, NBC was picking that up. But then <laughs> 2 months later, it was saying <laughs> it was canceled like even yeah, before talk, the yeah. pilot was aired so it never even came on tv that type of stuff is pretty common but, but i don't know I, I don't know if it would have been a good tv show yeah i don't know either i guess it depends on how they handle it but yeah if, if, if it's just like a very clingy person that would get kind of old pretty fast yeah think. and just having Leah Remini being annoyed right, in which every is single she episode. Had done in King of Queens for however many years. Yeah, right? with her, <laughs> her husband. The same type You're of right. Thing. One thing we didn't really talk about too much is just the box office success of this movie. So you know how yeah. we said that everyone loved it. It's probably because a lot of people saw it. It's the number nineteen performer on our list. Just amazing to see it that high. That it's like in the top twenty-five box office. I mean, yeah, performers I think people are year. just like, oh, let's go see Bill Murray. Yeah, it must have been something like that. But I'm, I'm kind of surprised that we didn't... I don't remember our family renting it as a kid, and we loved, you know, comedy. virtually everything comedy, and we, you know, we rented Bill Murray stuff otherwise, so it's just weird, but yeah. 
I just, it was on cable a lot. You had like a $9 million opening weekend and 63.7 million grand total. Yeah. So it did very well. So on to rankings and ratings. On your one to five star scale, where would you put What About Bob? I'm going to give this a three. Three? Okay, so like middle of the road. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on my zero to four star scale, I'm probably about the same. I, uh, I think I'll say, oh gosh, I guess I'll say a two. I'll just go straight up middle of the road. Again, I, I know that a lot of people love this movie a lot more than we do, but I don't know. It was fine. It had moments, <laughs> but nothing great. Uh, every movie's worth watching once. Would you watch it again? Yeah. I guess so. I don't know. Like, I feel like I got enough out of it. I would watch just to, for certain things. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know. I, 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 just like, uh, just the way characters handle other characters in this movie bother me a bit too much, maybe. I don't know. All right. So I'm going to say probably not. Okay. Um, but if you out there want to watch one about Bob, as of this recording in August 2021, it's available on digital rental, VHS, or DVD. So always check your local listings. Uh, as for us, you can listen to us on all of the major podcasting platforms. Please rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends. It really does help us out a lot. You can email us at 1991movierewind at gmail.com to tell us why we're wrong. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. Just search 1991 Movie Rewind or go to 1991movierewind.com for the full list of movies along with show notes and more. Next week, we're going to do something a little weird. <laughs> we're going to watch a TV movie mm-hmm. uh, starring Mark Lynn Baker, uh, better known from Perfect Strangers. He's going to be in a movie called Bear Essentials. That's available on YouTube or VHS only. We will see you then. Thanks.